started by sharing my screen. There we go. Hopefully you are now all seeing the, there we go. Everybody's seeing the cover slide 2021 legal update. Great, thumbs up, fantastic. Okay, I am gonna go through a lot of things here. I think we've got about 60 slides and I'm not sure if our, do we have, do we have one hour or an hour and a half this morning? One hour, so we gotta wrap up by one. So we got to get through things a little bit quickly. I will say I'm a little embarrassed by my website. It's pretty out of date, to be honest with you. In fact, it's so out of date that we got a warning from our uh, from our host last week that it's it's uh, it has to be updated onto their new platform by the end of March, or else my whole website goes down. So that that it don't go there until the end of March, and then you'll see a brand new website. But uh, in any event, all right, here we go. So I'm going to begin with a roadmap of where we're gonna to go today, okay? We're gonna talk about recent legislation. Then we're gonna talk about issues related to health plans, retirement plans, wage and hour, worker classification, and just general other reason authority. And we will conclude talking about COVID and related matters. And in fact, if my colleague Christine is on, um, she's gonna handle the, uh, the presentation on COVID. Uh, she's kind of our firm COVID expert. If not, I can handle those slides as well. Uh, we'll see how we how it goes when you get to that point. So with that, so there's that. First, we'll go over some recent legislation. And you'll see it all right there. Here we are, point by point. All right, first point, recent legislation. Moving on, let's talk about the Consolidated Appropriations Act. You would not be faulted for wondering why the heck are we talking about this in a SHRM seminar? And in fact, uh, why are we going to, going to be talking about this on several slides in a SHRM webinar? Because it had a heck of a lot more to, it, it covered a lot more things than just COVID relief. You know, over 5,000 pages, there's a lot more, more in there than just those, those uh, stimulus checks that a lot of people got, okay? Uh, to understand the scope of how big this is, many commenters are calling it the mini ACA, okay? So that, that should help you understand that there's, there's a lot in there passed very, at the very end of, uh, of last year. Okay, moving on. There are three primary focuses or foci, if you want to be technical, uh, that we're gonna cover here under the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Uh, it works to reduce out of network costs and we'll explain to you how it does that. It works to increase uh, cost transparency for health plans, we'll talk about that. And there are a number of changes relating to flexible spending accounts, all right? There are also some changes that affect retirement plans, which we'll talk about when we get to those as well. All right, first, a sub, you know, a subheading under the CAA or you know, Consolidated Appropriations Act is the No Surprises Act, all right? Now I'm gonna tell you all about it and you need to know that this becomes effective next year. Technically, if you're in a, in a health plan, it, it, it's effective for health plan years beginning on or after January 1 of 2022. Of course, if you have a calendar year plan, then it's just January 1st. All right, what does the Surprise Act do? It's intended to protect participants from surprise medical bills for out-of-network emergency care and ancillary services by out-of-network providers at in-network facilities. I don't know if anybody has ever encountered this. You know, I generally represent only employers, but in recent years, I've had a number of matters where I've represented employees at the request of their employers. So they've got, you know, long time, uh, well supported, you know, well respected employees who get hit with these surprise bills and the employers, you know, have engaged me to help the employees deal with these surprise bills um, and, and to help the employers, frankly, because uh, in some cases the, the plans have some liability as well. So uh, this is this is a very much needed change. And what is it going to do? It's going to make it so that participants pay only the in-network cost sharing amount in the circumstances covered by the act. It's going to bar balance billing. You know, balance billing is where um, an out-of-network provider bills the insurance. They get a, a lower payment from the insurance because they only get the out-of-network rate. And then they, they go ahead and they bill the balance to the participant. And, and they jack those rates. I mean, they're very high. And so these balance bills are gonna be barred. 
uh, an interesting thing is that uh, the No Surprises Act does include uh, an independent uh, dispute resolution procedure. It, it consists of arbitration. And here's the, here's the interesting part. Uh, the loser pays the arbitration costs. Now, in, in, in ERISA, you know, there is a, uh, an attorney fee shifting provision, but generally that's discretionary. You know, a, a judge can look at all the facts and say, you know, was this a legitimate challenge? You know, even if the plaintiff loses, if they had a, uh, a good basis to make their complaint, they can either, uh, they certainly won't get charged attorney's fees against them, and they very well may get attorney's fees from the other side, even if they lose, as long as there was a, a good faith uh, complaint. That's very different here. Here, loser pays just flat out. Uh, I think that's called the English rule. Uh, whoever whoever loses the uh, the dispute has to pay the full costs of arbitration, and those costs are are not insubstantial. They would include the cost for the arbitrator's time and probably certain filing and other other litigation costs. All right. Now, what are some substantive provisions of the No Surprises Act? A plan must pay or deny an out of network claim within 30 days. That's the other part of these surprises. Sometimes they come up months and months after services are provided where people thought everything was taken care of. And then all of a sudden this surprise out of network claim comes up and you know it's a bill for uh, $35,000, you know, something that no individual is really expecting. So number one, uh, you've got to pay or deny within 30 days. All right, number two, the, the, uh, the, your, your health plan card, whether it's a hard card or an electronic card, has to disclose the deductibles for both in-network and out-of-network care it has to disclose the out-of-pocket maximum, and it has to provide a, a contact info, a phone and a website for assistance on dealing with uh, in-network and out-of-network issues. Another requirement of the No Surprises Act, you, uh, plans or providers will now have to provide an advance explanation of benefits. And here's when it has to come, uh, and this is, this is for scheduled care. So if you're going in for scheduled care, they've got to tell you, um, no later than one day after you schedule the care and at least three business days before the care, they've got to provide this advanced explanation of benefits. Now what's in there is on the next slide. The advanced EOB has to include whether the provider, provider or facility is in network. If it's in network, then they've got to tell you the rate that is that they charge under the plan. If it's out of network, then they've got to tell you, oh, we're out of network, but here's how you can find an in-network provider. OK, uh, they've got to give a good faith estimate of the cost that's received by the provider or facility. They've got to tell you the amount the plan has to pay, another good faith estimate of cost sharing for the participant and more. There's a bunch of small details that have to be in there that I thought were, were more detailed than the scope of this webinar. But note that there is also a disclaimer requirement that, you know, a number of the things in there are good faith estimates and that the actual numbers may uh, may vary. All right. Um, Things that employers or the plan sponsors are going to need to do uh, in light of the surprise, No Surprises Act. First of all, if you have a self-funded plan, and, and we know that the number of self-funded plans as a percentage of employer-provided plans has increased greatly over the past many years, um, self-funded plans are going to have to revise their TPA agreements to include uh, the 30-day payment or denial provisions that we mentioned, to include the loser pay arbitration cost provision, and there's details that I didn't get into, there's certain air ambulance services and there's reporting requirements related to those. So TPAs are going to have to do more. And so if you're a self-funded plan that works with a TPA, uh, even if that TPA is a uh, an insurance carrier with an administrative services only contract, you're going to have to update your contracts to make sure that they deal with all of these issues. So it's going to be a big year. And, and again, this, this stuff is all effective at the beginning of next year. So I would anticipate, you know, throughout this year, these issues are going to come up. Obviously, uh, it would be great if you could do them now, but I suspect things will really start getting hot uh, after Labor Day, you know, between then and the end of the year. But uh, the sooner you do it, the, uh, the better you'll, you know, the more time you'll have to plan and make sure things get done right. Okay, all of your summary plan descriptions and plan documents are going to be needed, needed are going to need to be updated. And this is, you know, not just self-funded plans, fully insured, whatever. If it's fully insured, it's possible that your insurer provides the SPD. You may do the document, it depends. People have different arrangements. But uh, the bottom line is these are both going to need to be updated, the plan doc and the SPD, to cover these additional mandates under the No Surprises Act. And uh, finally, you're gonna have to confirm that your TPAs are 
able and, and ready and prepared to comply with the ID card mandates and the advanced EOBs. Okay. Other uh, other minor details in the No Surprises Act, and I say minor just with respect to, not just with respect to the quantity of, of the detail of the guidance in there, but also with respect to the relative importance that I suspect most employers will assign to these issues. There are also provisions in there relating to continuity of care for ongoing patients whose providers were initially in network and then who go to out of network. They basically have the, uh, they will have the ability to continue uh, to receive care from their providers and the providers are gonna have to be, uh, you know, even though they go out of network, uh, they will, they'll be treated as if they were in network. Um, there's a price comparison tool. Uh, this also, uh, you know, this price comparison and price disclosures has been an ongoing thing for the past few years. Um, the No Surprises Act gives more guidance there. There has to be phone guidance available along with the required website tool and provider directories have to be updated every 90 days. A lot of this uh, disclosure and, and provider information hasn't been particularly useful because some of the information on there is very dated. And now it has to be updated at least once every 90 days. All right, so we mentioned the Consolidated Appropriations Act had three primary focuses. The first was reducing out of network costs. We've talked about that briefly. I'm sorry? Oh. Okay, maybe not. It was just a, uh, I think I heard somebody's background noise. Anyway, moving on to the second point, we're going to talk about cost transparency. Okay, um, cost transparency. I think we've got four slides on this. This is the first. Now, gag clauses in planned contracts have to be removed effective immediately. Now, what are gag clauses? Uh, oftentimes, um, plans have contracts with networks where you know, provider specific cost data, quality of care data, and, you know, claims data is considered um, pr not, not protected information, that's a HIPAA term, but it's a proprietary information that these networks say, hey, we're not giving you this stuff. Uh, you, you know, yeah, you can sign onto our network, but that's, this is all our data. Even though it relates to your participants, it's our data. Well, no longer. Plans now have access to all of this data. They can share the data with their business associates. And so immediately, uh, plans need to go through their uh, network or TPA agreements for any gag clauses that are in there and remove them. Okay, it's just simple as that. So that's an immediate thing that needs to be done. Part two on transparency, which was effective last week, uh, the way that we became effective last week is it was effective, I think, 45 days after the law passed. So that if I counted right, that took it out to February 10th. And there are provisions with respect to mental health parity and addiction equity. Okay. Um, the Mental Health Parity Act, Addiction Equity Act, it was finally, it was finally given teeth. Oh gosh, it's been about 10 years ago now. And yet still there are there are issues with making sure that uh, parity is provided for mental health benefits compared to other other uh, physical health benefits. Okay, so how what, what is the trend, what is the CAA doing about this? Pan, plans now have to prepare a detailed comparative analysis comparing their mental health uh, benefits and usage with other uh, benefits and usage, okay, to, to non-mental health parity slash addiction equity benefits, okay? The comparative analysis is extremely detailed. Going into the details is beyond the scope of this webinar. In fact, it's so detailed that I doubt that any plan sponsor will do it on their own. They will quite likely require uh, an outside specialist or vendor to, to prepare this comparative analysis for them. Okay, right now the analysis does not need to be submitted annually or anything like that. It just has to be on hand at all times and so that it's able to be provided upon request to HHS, DOL, or any uh, state authority with jurisdiction over the plan. Those would generally be state insurance regulators. Okay, now, you know, keep in mind this was effective last week. I hope that, uh, you know, it, I recognize this is possibly the first time you've heard of this. But if, you, if it is the first time you've heard of it, uh, supposedly you're supposed to have this comparative analysis already done, okay? Um, I would encourage you to get on this one pretty quickly and, you know, you know begin, you know, talking to your, uh, whether it's your self-funded plan consultant who helps you design the plan or your broker, whoever you're dealing with, this is another action item to get on quickly. All right, transparency item number three. Um, let me give you a little background on this one. Under ERISA, 
there are certain transactions that are prohibited and these transactions are prohibited with the intention of, of protecting the viability and the integrity of the ERISA plan, okay? And one of the transactions that's prohibited is a, is a transaction with any service provider. Well, guess what? Every plan has to, has to transact business with service providers, whether they be lawyers, accountants, you know, consultants, whoever, okay? So what does ERISA do? ERISA has written into the text a, a statutory prohibited transaction called the Necessary Services Exemption. And basically it says that, you know, although it's prohibited for a plan to contract with a service provider, a plan may contract with a service provider so long as uh, the contract is reasonable. And there's a, there's a set of rules for reasonable. The, the one that is usually the biggest issue that is not necessarily satisfied is that any contract with a service provider has to be terminable basically upon 60 days notice. And every plan provider out there has, you know, terms to their agreements and uh, you know costs if you if you want to terminate that shortly and there can they can they have the right to recoup their startup costs but uh, but they've got to be prorated over the term of the contract anyway setting that aside with with that background um, the CAA modifies the necessary services exemption that's in ERISA to say that uh, contracts for brokerage or consulting services will only be reasonable if they make certain disclosures, including the fiduciary status of the service provider. So they've got to say, hey, we are a fiduciary or we're not, or you know, here's the fiduciary services that we're providing. They've got to disclose the direct and indirect compensation that they receive. Um, you know, They may get indirect compensation for directing a plan to, to specific vendors or something like that. They've got, to, they've got to disclose all of their direct and indirect compensation. And if there's any changes to the items subject to disclosure, They've got to notify the plans of those changes within 60 days and provide the new information. Okay, what does this mean as a practical matter to you? Um, there have been uh, some rules in recent years on the retirement plan side for providers to disclose the direct and indirect compensation that they receive. Really, generally, when they're when they're fiduciaries mostly, but also some TPAs are subject to that rule. So this, this takes that regime and it moves it over to the health plan side as well. And frankly, um, I know that there is a very large amount of direct and indirect compensation received you know, by insurers. I mean, you, you would be shocked if you see some of the underlying data, the, you know, the, the portion of premium that goes to actually substantive benefits versus the portion that goes to compensation to the broker or the consultant or the, or the insurer. Uh, it's, it's huge. And so when these disclosures are made, the anticipated result is that it should have a downward pressure on healthcare costs. We'll see what happens. Um, I hope that it does because these costs just keep going up and up and up. And of course we'd like to see them go down. So we'll see how this, how this plays out. So uh, any effect, this, this is effective at the end of this year, December 27th, a year after the law was passed. Final slide on transparency, drug price reporting. Okay. Uh, the first report is due again this December 27th. After that, June 1st of every year, the report will be due. So you'll have one December 27th of this year and then June 1 of 22 and every June 1st thereafter. Now, the drug price reporting it includes a bunch of stuff. I didn't include it all here, but just hitting the, the top highlights. Of course, all of your plan identifying information plus your top 50 branded prescription drugs and the number of claims that you paid on those drugs, the top 50 most expensive prescription drugs for a plan, and the 50 prescription drugs that have had the largest increase in plan costs for the year that's being reported. All right, you also have to report cost savings that a plan uh, enjoys from either re rebates or coupons for prescription drug manufacturers. All right, so again, the idea being that with drug price reporting, Perhaps this is going to put a, a downward pressure on drugs. Uh, I'm, I'm slide three, the prior one. Um, I think that's going to have a, more, a greater downward pressure than this drug price reporting, but we'll see what happens. All right. Finally, the third focus: FSA changes. Here we go. All right. Now these are these are flexible spending accounts. You know, employee benefits lawyers are notorious for their use of acronyms. And I'm sure that I've already used acronyms in here that I didn't explain. I hope everybody understands them. I'll try to do better. 
but uh, FSA is a flexible spending account and there are health flexible spending accounts and dependent care flexible spending accounts. And so these are changes for this year and next. So, and, and most FSAs operate on a calendar year. So for the year ending in 2021, which is probably December 31st of this year, election changes are permitted this year without regard to the qualifying events and the regulations. Now, bear in mind, these are permissive. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. But if you want to, you can amend your cafeteria plan to permit election changes this year, for lack of a better term, willy-nilly, you know, without regard to qualifying events. There's just a, a recognition that people are in, a, in a, a tumultuous position because of COVID, because of the work changes that have happened there. And so there's this ability to do election changes without regard to qualifying events. As an aside, for any of you on here, I didn't go through the attendee list, but I suspect I have a few clients on here. You know that I always said the the uh, the cafeteria plan rules are, are much ado about nothing because they've never, you know, I've never in 30, however many, 30, 32 years now that I've been in this industry, literally never seen a cafeteria plan get audited. You know, the IRS has twice put out proposed regulations and never finalized them. First, they did it in 87. And then they never finalized them. And they came out with new ones in 2007. Oh, we, we're going to finalize them next year. Yeah, well, what is it now? Uh, 14 years later, they still haven't finalized them. You know, they just don't care. So anyways, this is here, should you want to know it. This year, last year and this year, the grace period can be extended up to a full 12 months instead of 2.5. So uh, to, to ameliorate that use or lose provision that's in there. And you can carry forward all, all unused funds. Uh, not just the cap. The cap started out at 500, and it, it may have been adjusted upward. Uh, regardless of that cap, all unused funds in your account can be carried forward from last year to this year, and from whoa, that's a long way in the future. I spell check didn't catch 2020-01, but uh, that means 2021 to 2022. So from last year to this year, and this year to next. All right, other FSA changes. Um, Terminated participants can use their the money in their account through the end of the year, including a grace period that's provided to active employees. Dependent care can cover expenses that go up to the 14th birthday. It was primary, you know, before up to age 13. So it's basically been bumped up a year. There's an alternative to that. If you don't go, want to go to the 14th birthday, the year in which they turn 13, you can allow the expenses to go to the end of the year. Um, I don't know. You know, I guess there's a lot more kids maybe who might have dependent care because I, I don't know because they, they've got homeschool. Who, who knows what's going on? But regardless of why that is, it's a it's a little bit of uh, extra ability to use dependent care funds and uh, flexible spending account amendments to incorporate any of these changes that you choose to incorporate. These amendments are permitted retroactively as long as you amend it by the last day of the first plan year beginning after the plan year in which the amendment takes effect. In other words, for changes effective this year, you have to amend them by the end of next year. Or if you're going to increase your rollover amount from 2020, your amendment would need to be done by the end of this year. Okay, so uh, issue there, just a kind of a housekeeping thing. A lot of people tend to do FSA changes and cafeteria plan changes in general. They tend to run them as payroll practices and they oftentimes don't update their documents, uh, but you really should even though the IRS never audits them. Okay, there's, there's what it is. All right, moving on to other issues involving health plans. I know we talked a lot about the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act, but there are other issues dealing with health plans that I want that bear mentioning before we get into all of the other more traditional employment law matters. Okay, first of all, reporting. We're talking your, your ACA reporting. 1095Cs, the extended date was pushed back to March 2nd, which is still coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, if you provide the electronic disclosure to the IRS, so the 1095C is to participants are due March 2nd. Uh, the reporting to the IRS, the 1094C and the 1095Cs, if, if you do it electronically, which is the preferred way, that's pushed back to March 31. However, if you do paper, they were due back to the IRS by February 1. This is the biggest push for any people who are left on paper to get onto electronic that I can imagine because you're already late if you're on paper and you probably haven't done them yet. So it's time for everybody to move to electronics. If you need a 30 day extension, you can get it on IRS form 8809, easily, easily obtained on the web. Okay, now, um, this slide is a material change from every slide that we've had so far. Every slide that we've had so far, we're talking about new rules, things that you need to be aware of, 
uh, through the legislative or uh, administrative guidance process. Here we have a court case that's not even in our circuit. We're all in the Ninth Circuit. These are this is the federal circuit courts. This is from the Second Circuit, which is back east. It's New York, uh, parts of New England. You know, regardless, uh, this case is important, and it's worth mentioning because you know many circuits follow each other, even though it's not mandatory to do so. They often do, and this case I think has a a big enough lesson that I want to make sure that everybody realizes this. And this is that ultimately health plans are liable for the decisions of their TPAs or for the mistakes of their TPAs. Now, I'm going to tell you about the mistake in this case, but why would you want to know this? You would want to go through your TPA contracts and make sure that they indemnify you for their mistakes. Because oftentimes those contracts have the exact opposite. They say, hey, you know, we're not liable for anything other than gross negligence. Well, a lot of mistakes are, are done at a level less than gross negligence. We're all human. We all make mistakes, right? So um, you, the, your contract with them may, may provide that you're liable for their mistake. I would encourage you to look at those contracts and, and, and focus on renegotiating them and use this case as your authority, as your opening for negotiations to say, look, we hire you to do the job. And even if your mistake is, is not due to gross negligence, you should still be on the hook for it, not us. You guys should get insurance to cover this, not us, okay? Here's the deal. Second Circuit, employer provided life insurance. Uh, one times pay was the life insurance amount. This particular worker, I don't know if they were part-time or what, but the bottom line is they only made 16800 a year. And so the insurance that they should have been provided was that amount. But instead, the plan offered them $679,000 of insurance. Okay, well, of course, uh, somebody signed up for that, all right? And the woman who signed up for it was, was ill. She was dying. Her daughter quit work to care for her, and the daughter, out of her own pocket, paid all of the mom's bills, you know, everything. She just took care of everything because she knew that you know, the mom was going to die soon, and there was going to be $679,000 coming in, which was, you know, was going to, you know, certainly more than cover her, her uh, expenses, well, uh, mom dies and insurance company says, oops, it wasn't 679,000, it was only 16,800, sorry. Court says, uh, not oops, she gets the full 679. You know, we don't care if it was an innocent mistake, a clerical oversight or whatever. The bottom line is she was offered it, she gets it. Oh, and the plan is liable for the mistake, not the TPA, the plan was sued. So just, just be aware of this, everybody makes mistakes. Look at the procedures you have in place to try to prevent them, but even, even procedures go wrong sometimes. So look at the, the stops you have in place, the insurance you have in place, or the agreements you have with your, with your service providers to make sure that they are on the hook for mistakes like this, not you. All right. Uh, these are a couple of fading issues, but they're also based on current events, so I wanted to mention them to you. Um, first of all, you may or may not know, you know, there's, there's different there's a maximum deductible for individuals under the ACA and a maximum for families. And uh, there was confusion on this when somebody has fa family coverage um, and, it, and only one individual has care or receives care. Is that individual subject to the individual deductible or the, or the generally twice as high family deductible? And uh, there was ambiguity about that before 16 because they said, well, you're under a family plan. So one person has to pay the full family deductible. And that was what a lot of plans did. Regs came out effective in 16 that said, no, if you're in a family plan, but only one person gets care, that one person is still subject to the individual deductible, not the family deductible, okay? Um, but just know that that was only a, a pro, a looking forward regulation. And so there are still cases around where people are fighting over this and just know that, you know, if, if you've got any of those old claims out there, you know, before 2016, individuals could be charged with family max but they no longer are able to do that. Okay, another one. Final grandfathered plan regs came out in October, I believe, all right? Now, first of all, why do I say final? We just had a change in administrations. We just had 40 some executive orders, you know, in the first week trying to change the prior administration's positions on things. There are some things that are easy to change and there's some things that are difficult to change. Any proposed regs that have not been finalized are very easy to change. You just suspend them, you repropose them, no big deal. But final regulations, they're final. They're law, they have the force of law, and you can't get rid of them easy, okay? 
So these final grandfather plan regs generally made it easier to mean they, they tried to make it easier to maintain a grandfather plan. But the question I have, I ask my question, my clients this, and when I teach classes, I ask everybody in the class this all the time, who has a grandfather plan left? And, you know, I don't think anybody does because it was, you know, this was, grandfather plans were the, you know, going back to, if you like your plan, you can keep it. Um, and they made those regulations so egregiously impossible to satisfy because we, you know, the real goal was, we, they wanted to get rid of all of those plans, even if you did like them, they wanted them gone. And they were quite effective at that. And so we've got these final grandfather plan regs that you know, may make it easier to maintain it if you're one of the one in a thousand people who still has a grandfather plan. Alternatively, if you had your grandfather plan, you kept up the good fight for quite a while, but eventually you gave in, you may be able to revisit that decision if you want to go back to your grandfathered plan status. Um, it's there. If anybody has deeper questions on this, come, you know, ask me offline later and I'll, I'll, I'll try to help you with that. Okay, moving on from other health plan issues to retirement plan issues. And guess what? The CAA, the gift that keeps on giving, it also has some issues dealing with retirement plans. First of all, partial terminations. Now, again, this isn't a, this is not a, uh, an acronym. This is something that needs a little bit of brief background uh, explanation. Um, if you had a retirement plan and the plan terminates, everybody in the plan has to become immediately and fully vested. So a, a termination cannot work to the disadvantage of plan participants with respect to vesting. Now, there are things called partial plan terminations. And these are where um, you know, a certain percentage of employees are terminated and so they lose coverage under the plan and the IRS considers basically a 20% reduction in plan coverage to be a partial termination. What happens in a partial termination? Everyone who is affected by the termination has to be fully vested. Those who stay on don't, but those who are terminated have to be fully vested. Um, and, and why does anybody care about this? You know, I, I suppose some plans use, use forfeitures from vesting to, play, to pay plan administration costs. That's really the only reason that the employers would care about this. Uh, but regardless, during COVID, lots of businesses had far more than 20% reductions in their workforces. You know, restaurants, you know, they, they were working with a skeleton crew. And under the, under the, the rules that were in place, many of these plans would have uh, partial terminations and they would have to fully vest everybody who was affected by those, okay? So this is a temporary rule designed to deal with COVID and a plan will not have a partial termination during the year that started, you know, during any plan year, which includes the period that started last March and ends the end of this March. So long as by the end of this March, they have at least 80% of the people who they had last year, okay? I suspect this is gonna play out just like the PPP loans. You know, the PPP loans were written on this idea that by the end of June, everybody was gonna have full employment going on again. And then they extended it and they pushed it back farther and realized, you know, nobody understood just how long this effect was going to last. So this is obviously based on the idea that, hey, by the end of March this year, everybody's going to be back to 80% of their full employment. Fat chance. I don't think that's really going to happen. You know, maybe, maybe by the end of the summer, you know, more likely by the end of this year. Okay. So just anticipate further guidance on this, um, but it's it's out there. Be aware of this. And, and of course, it's it's agnostic as to reason. So even if you have, you know, if you're shutting down a division for release, reasons unrelated to COVID, if you do it during this period, you can get out of the partial termination rules. So just FYI, that's out there. Okay, another another COVID blip um, problem. Last year, the CARES Act permitted special COVID distributions from retirement plans. The idea being that if people were out of work, they might need to tap their retirement plan money to, to use it for living, okay? Well, there was a blip in that anybody who has a money purchase plan, you can't have an in-service distribution before age 59 and a half. And this, the Consolidated Appropriations Act fixed that. It just says um, you can have, you, you can get in-service distributions from money purchase plans also regardless of age. So, but here's the weird thing. COVID distributions had to happen by the end of last year it looks like basically this is just a, a fix for people in these plans who might have gotten distributions and found out, oops, I wasn't entitled to them, and they fixed it. 
But regardless, it's a new law. It's in there. I want to make sure you're aware of it. Okay. Other things, benefit limits. You've probably already seen these. You're going to be getting my slides later if you want them. They'll be in there. I don't need to go through these. These things get updated every year. I just have them in there for reminders so that you know that they're there. Okay. Here's another critical litigation matter from a very uh, from two recent cases. One from the Tenth Circuit, which is you know the Mountain States. Utah, Colorado, well, not mountains in Kansas, but Utah, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, I believe. Eighth Circuit is uh, north, like Minnesota area. Okay. So um, here's, and here's what this goes to. We all know that in our role as, as plan sponsors and plan administrators, we do our best to make the right decisions. We also know we deal with lots of people who might disagree with our decisions. Fortunately, the law under ERISA protects the decisions that we make unless they are egregiously unreasonable, okay? And the way that the law does this is that if anybody challenges one of the decisions that we make, whether it's a decision on their benefit claim or whether it's a decision on, on how we interpret a plan with respect to eligibility or any other provision, they must prove that our decision was unreasonable. And the way that they do that is, is the judge looks at the decision and the judge can do one of two things. He can look at it and say, is there any rational basis to support this decision? It doesn't have to be the most reasonable decision. It doesn't have to be the decision that I, the judge, would make. It just has to have, it has, to have some basis and rationality to support it. If there is, the decision stands and the claimant loses. Alternatively, on the other standard, it's called the de novo standard. And that's where the judge says, hey, Plan, plan administrator, I don't care what you did. Let me see the facts, and I'm going to call the shot the way that I think that shot should be called. Of course, as plan administrators, we want that, that discretionary deferential level of review. And so claimants are continually attacking that deferential standard review because they lose under that standard almost always. But if they can get to de novo review, they have a much greater chance of winning. So we as plan administrators, we want to run our plans in ways that maintain that discretionary standard of review. And here's a couple of cases that give us a couple of new pieces of guidance that are really important to maintaining that standard, okay? The first is that you've got to tell participants in your summary plan description, hey, but, you know, because at the end of your SPD, there's a section in there that's the, the mandated statutory language that tells them, hey, you've got a right to sue if you disagree with any decision on this plan, okay? You now have to, at least in the 10th Circuit, mandatorily, but I would advise everybody in all circuits to, to take this guidance because I think it's a reasonable, a reasonable step to take. You've got to inform participants, hey, by the way, our, our decisions are subject to deference from a court. And if you try to challenge us, you've got to prove that we were entirely unreasonable. Okay. So in other words, that's going to discourage them from bringing claims, which is a good thing. And if they do bring a claim, it's going to make sure that you keep that deferential standard because in the 10th Circuit, if you don't tell them about that, guess what? Even though you otherwise would have gotten it, boom, you're kicked to de novo, which means you're probably, you have a much greater chance of losing. So very important suggestion to update your summary plan descriptions to include a description of the deferential abuse of discretion standard of review, okay? Very important. Be glad to talk with anybody about this. Provide some sample language to your SPD uh, if, you, if you want to pursue that. Okay, in the Eighth Circuit, they had a case, you know, oh, Oh, incidentally, in the 10th Circuit, the plan did not uh, explain to participants that deferential standard, so they lost it. They were under de novo, and the participant won. So, yeah, there's a lesson there. Eighth Circuit, they just said, look, an administrator's procedural irregularities don't spoil discretionary review unless they become a serious breach of fiduciary duty, okay? Here's what happened. A plan administrator, I think they had 30 days to decide a claim or something, and they decided in like 31 days. You know, they were a tiny bit late. They said, look, a tiny bit late doesn't mean that you, you go directly to de novo review. There's, if, if there's an irregularity, it's got to be a serious breach of a fiduciary duty. Like you never give them an answer on a claim, okay? Claims are deemed to be denied after a certain number of days. And if you never give an answer, well, that's a serious breach of fiduciary duty. But if you're a tiny bit late or if you use the wrong form, but it's, you know, you're communicating clearly, but you've used an outdated form or something, any of these issues could come up. This is good news for plan sponsors. That, uh, that, you know, you're going to be protected from reasonable irregularities, but, you know, you still have to avoid those serious breaches of fiduciary duty. Okay, 
And that's that's a huge issue that that prior slide I just moved back to. The standard review, you know, in HR, we always get attacked for being cost centers, not profit drivers. But let me tell you what, um, when a, when an ERISA case comes, and in, you know, in my life, I deal with them all the time. In your life, I always tell people, yeah, you're going to get one every 15 to 20 years. But when that case comes, and it will come over a career, um, when you when you protect the company from that huge lawsuit because of your prudent actions, you know, you're proving your value there. All right. The SECURE Act, why am I talking about that? SECURE Act passed in December of 19, right? Well, there's a couple of things that kick in place this year. This year, okay, traditionally we've been able to exclude from our retirement plans people who don't complete 1,000 hours a year. Now, to us, 1,000 hours as a practical matter is part-time because we all work 2080 a year, right? But uh, regardless, for for qualified plan purposes, full-time means 1,000 hours a year. And if you're not full-time, if you're under 1,000 hours a year, you don't ever get to come to a plan. Well, the Secure Act said, um, nope, we get to bring in part-timers. People who work 500 hours a year for three consecutive years get to come in. Now, we don't have to look back at those 500 hours. We start counting this year. But this year, next year, 2023, you look at those, if somebody gets 500 hours in each of those years, then guess what? You got to let them into your plan January 1 of 2024. So you got to start tracking hours for under 1,000 hour people for retirement plan purposes. Uh, this should be something that you're aware of, but it's because it's effective this year. I want to make sure you are. Pooled employer plans. These are uh, multiple employer plans that are intended to be easier to have. Most folks on this call, large employers, I suspect already have their plans in place. Any very small employers who may not have been putting retirement plans in place, um, have, you know, they might have been doing it because of the administrative cost. Well, these plans are going to drive down those costs. And to the extent we have anybody on this call who's a, who's a third party administrator, you may want to be an administrator for one of these plans. And if so, uh, there's an EBSA form PR, that's the name of the form, form PR, that you've got to submit to be able to sponsor a pooled employer plan. Um, uh, there was another comment I wanted to make on those, but it's, uh, is it going to come back to me? Nope, so we'll move on. Okay, um, another fiduciary duty obligation, new final regulations, again, final regulations, they're not going anywhere, they're going to be around for the long haul, even, even with the change in administration. Final regs issued October 30th, dealing with the fiduciary duty associated with selecting investment funds that are available for participants to invest in. So even if you think you've got an ERISA 404c plan, that's the 404c, that's the section of ERISA that allows you to shift fiduciary responsibility to participants for their own investment outcomes based on them having the right to direct their own investments. Well, you still have fiduciary responsibility for the selection of the investments between which the participants can elect. And there's a full regulation on this now. This in itself is a full day seminar. I can't cover any of the details here, but I want you to be aware of it. For any of you who have a 401k, profit sharing money, purchase plan, any kind of a plan that has participant directed investments, you're subject to this reg now. You need to be on top of it. And you really need to review your investment fund selection. Even if you've done it before, you need to redo it again under the guidance, under the auspices of these new rules so that you can be assured that you're following these. Because what? If you don't, it's a breach of fiduciary duty. And that's where that's where they can get you. Participants, if they breach of fiduciary duty claims are expensive claims to, to deal with. So you want to make sure that you follow these rules there. So yeah. Whoever deals with your retirement plan, go talk to them. Make sure that say, hey, let's talk about this new investment investment fund selection fiduciary duty rule. Let's have it. Let's have a discussion on that. All right. Now moving out of benefits, and you know I'm a benefits geek, but I do dabble in employment law from time to time. So here we are on some more traditional employment law matters. Okay, wage and hour. Washington State. You're all certainly aware that our minimum wage is now $13.69. I remember when we bumped up to the higher minimum wage and, yeah, and we, you know, we had the schedule out for the number of years and it maxed out at $13.50. Then we said after that, it's going to be adjusted for inflation. Well, now we're in that inflationary adjusted year. It's $13.69. Unless, of course, you operate in Seattle where it's $16.69 or SeaTac at the airport, I guess, $16.57. That's crazy. Just think about that. My first job minimum wage was $3.35 an hour. I got my first job paying five bucks an hour. I thought I was loaded. Five bucks an hour, baby. 
because I was a buck 65 over the minimum. I felt great. All right. But anyway, in Washington State, you can't count tips toward the minimum wage. You just can't. So if employers have ever done that, because there, there may have been provisions under federal law to be able to do that, but we're going to get to that in a bit later. But under Washington, you can't count tips toward minimum wage. The tips are their tips, and you still got to pay a minimum wage. It is what it is. Which brings the question, with a higher minimum wage, is, well, COVID's going to screw everything up. Everybody feels sorry for restaurants. But before COVID, did you reduce your tips a little bit? Because they're now they're getting, you're paying more for the food because the minimum wage is 13, but I don't know, who knows, whatever. But your tips don't count toward minimum wage. They get tips and 13.69 an hour. All right, new overtime rules in Washington State. These affect the executive administrative professional outside sales and computer professional exemptions. There's a new minimum salary level uh, for this year. It's one and a half times the minimum wage, which we, I've got the figures on there, that 800 figure a week or the 42 grand a year for small businesses, those having one to 50 employees. If you've got, if you're a large business with 51 or more employees, so the multiplier is 1.7, which gets you up to 958 a week or 49, almost $50,000 a year. And these are the salary levels you have to pay, you know, even if people meet, meet the duties of executive, admin, professional, outside sales computer, even if they meet those, you've got to pay these higher salaries for them to be overtime exempt. All right. Now that overtime exemption salary level is going up for this and the next seven years. So through 2028, when you get to 2028, it's everybody, small business, large business, everybody, if you're going to have an overtime exemption, those people have to have a salary of two and a half times the minimum wage. Well, the mathematical geniuses in our state have projected that out to be, you know, they projected out what the minimum wage is going to be in 2028. And so based on that, you know, for anybody to be overtime exempt in 2028, they're going to have to be making $1,500 a week or over $78,000 a year. Okay. So just realize that, you know, people making 60, 70 grand a year are going to be subject to overtime in 2028. Now it goes up, there's a schedule, you know, small businesses at 1.5 and it, it, it goes up to, to get them to 2.5 in 2028. Same with the large businesses, you know, 1.75, there's a schedule out there. And I've got the link on there. It's a nice little one page form that shows how the, uh, how the uh, wage multiplier progresses through 2028. All right, these new overtime rules also updated the job duties tests to be overtime exempt. We, you, we traditionally had two tests. They were different than the federal test. Basically, Washington's made our test align with the, uh, with the federal test and with the Fair Labor Standards Act, okay? And this test just determines whether a worker is actually performing management level or professional duties that can permit them to be overtime exempt. All right. Oh, goodness. You've, I'm sure many of you have heard about this. All my ag employers on the line. Okay. There was a November decision decided by one judge, right? Because it was a five to four decision. If one of the judges of the majority had flipped the other way, it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have come out this way. But they basically said, look, the overtime exemption in Washington for dairy workers is unconstitutional. All right. Well, the, the exception that they were relying on doesn't just say dairy workers. The ruling in the case involved dairy workers, but the RCW, the revised code section, applies to all agricultural workers. So the general assumption is that this case applies to all ag workers. And so overtime exemptions for ag workers, you know, I'm, I'm not, if you're an ag worker, I understand how hard this can hit your bottom line. I'm not going to tell you automatically go out and pay overtime, but I am going to tell you that you are going to be subject to increasing likelihood of litigation. You know, plaintiff's lawyers are going to be hitting up farm workers all day long to bring unpaid overtime claims, okay? Uh, the decision is retroactive. Fortunately, there's still a three-year limitation, so it can only go back to what, uh, 1918, about, about to 2017. Um, and the dairy workers, the reason it was unconstitutional for them was because they were exposed to health and safety risks. So to the extent you have an ag worker who doesn't, who's not exposed to a health and safety risk, they may not be subject to it, but, you know, um, others are. And here's what I would say. I wouldn't say just, just hope that it doesn't affect you, hope that you don't get sued. You got to start making some kind of financial preparedness for this, because I'm not going to say you pay it up front, but I would say maybe consider, you know, maybe consider paying them over time if you want. That's just one path you could take. If you're not going to do that, 
though, make sure that you have the resources that should your workers sue and get you know three years of retroactive unpaid overtime, that you've got the money to pay that. I represented a small client recently who got hit with an overtime uh, bill of uh, about half a million dollars for for a very small business. That's that's a big that's a big hit, you know. And and they got hit under the federal rules, not under the state rules. But uh, and under the federal rules, they've got to pay that off within three years. You know, the preference is they want it paid within 30 days. And I just started laughing at them. You think these guys have that kind of dough to pay in 30 days? You know, if you're a company and you're gonna you're gonna hope to not pay overtime to your ag workers, I would strongly encourage you to at least make some kind of you know, rainy day savings fund to cover this should the liability come up at some point. All right. And, you know, just work with council, deal with this, figure out how you're going to, how you're going to deal with this one. Okay. We're down to seven minutes. We're on slide 37. I think that still means we've got about 20 to go through. I got to up my speed as if I wasn't already talking fast enough. Okay. Another final rule uh, on, from the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, some people are, oh, this is the, this is the pool tipping rule. Okay. Basically, employers can have non-traditional tip pools where they include cooks and dishwashers, other people other than servers who don't particularly who normally traditionally don't share, share tips. Bottom line is employers cannot keep tips, and you can't cut the managers or supervisors in on any portion of the tip. Not allowed. Tips are just for the people who are defined in the tip pool places. Okay. New rule. Make sure you're aware of it if you've got tipped employees. And as we said earlier, in Washington, you can't count tips toward the minimum wage. They still have to receive the full minimum wage. Okay, worker classification. Here we go. Here's another piece of DOL recent guidance. This is the, uh, some people are calling this the gig worker rule, but uh, January 6th, there was a final rule issued under the Fair, Fair Labor Standards Act, which helps employers determine whether the people working for them are employees versus independent contractor. Yeah, this was targeted at you know Uber and all of those people, okay? What it does, it, it, you know, traditionally there's been this IRS 20 factor test and you look at the factors, you know, some of them are independent contractors, some are employees. Um, and a big one was, do they you know, provide their own tools? Well, if you're an Uber driver and you provide your own car, that's a pretty huge factor that you, under the old 20 factor test that you're an independent contractor. Well, now this ain't it. Now the question is, is a worker in his or her own business or is she dependent on the alleged employer? Every Uber driver is, is, is dependent on the alleged employer. Why? Because they don't have any way to pick up rides without the Uber app, okay? And there's, a, there's other employers. I'm just bringing up Uber because it's an easy example. So under the economic reality test, even though they may be driving a $25,000 car that's their own equipment, which under the old IRS test would make them independent contractor, now because um, they are completely dependent upon Uber for their revenue, for every penny of their revenue through the app, they are not in their own business. They're dependent on the employer and therefore they are employees, okay? Now, uh, two core, just extra details on this economic reality test. There are two core factors and then three, they call them guidepost factors, you know, three lesser factors. The, the two core factors, the nature and degree of the worker's control of the work and Uber drivers have a lot of control. You know, they can say I'm on, I'm on task, I'm off task, okay? The worker's opportunity for profit or loss based on initiative and or investment. Well, they, I mean, I guess the only profit or loss they have is, you know, if they get tips based on good service, um, but their investment is the car. I guess if they buy another a nicer car, they might get more rides, they might get better reviews. Um, uh, but again, because they're in, you know, entirely dependent upon Uber, they're not going to be deemed to have their own business. So they're not going to be employees. Guidepost factors, the amount of skill they have, the degree of performance, the work relationship, you can read in there. I need to read them to you. There they are. New DLL reg. If you've got gig workers, you need to pay special attention to this. All right. Other new authority. This is just other new stuff that relates to all other kind of potential HR areas that I want to go to you real quickly. Okay. I realized when I was typing this headline, you know, I told you we use a lot of, uh, a lot of acronyms. I finally said the EEOC on ADA and ICRA is LOL. Okay. Because EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Age Discrimination Employment Act on individual coverage, health reimbursement accounts. I did the LOL just because that's probably the most egregious three big uh, abbreviated words I've seen. Regardless, this EEOC guidance came out January 7th. Remember that that was uh, before the 20th. 
So this this uh, could be reversed, but um, but I doubt it. Um, although you never know, you never know. They could they could reverse this, but for now, what it basically says is an individual coverage HRA. That's where you the employer puts money into an HRA, only the employer, no employee dollars, and that money can be used for for employees to go out and buy their own individual health insurance. The idea is that if employers, you know, they may not have enough budget to provide full health care uh, for an employee, but they can make a contribution so the employee can buy their individual care. And uh, the more I think about it, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me for, for the Biden administration to reverse this because they, you know, the Obama administration hated HRAs. They did everything they could to shut them down. So right now this says, hey, we, we recognize insurance costs more for older folks than for younger folks. Um, if you put a flat dollar in there, it doesn't matter, even though, you know, 300 bucks might allow a, a younger person to buy 100% of their coverage, but for an older person, it may only be a small fraction. They said that's okay because everybody gets the same dollar amount. Same if you give everybody a uniform uh, percentage of, of whatever premium they pay, that's okay too. All right. But again, we'll see where that goes. Now this one, now we're into stuff after the transition. So January 28th, CMS on SEP. What does this mean? Well, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, they enforce... Uh, all kinds of the AC rules, including the special enrollment period rules. That's the SEP. Okay. There's a you know traditionally this has been at the end of the year. Um, now we've got a special enrollment period from this month to the middle of May, and people can enroll in coverage. If you've got people who do that, you need to be aware of that. I'm just trying to hustle through these next slides in the next two minutes. On the FMLA, basically this this guidance is is worthless because it says you know hey we've got to give an FMLA notice and you can provide it electronically. As long as, and if we get here, I wonder if I can, I can't highlight it, but ah. anyway, it's, it's only useful if all of your employees exclusively work remotely. A lot of everybody's employees work remotely now, but I don't think all of very many people's employees work remotely. So really this is kind of useless, electronic posting. All right. Um, another DOL guidance on the FMLA, this was actually worthwhile. This one says telemedicine can be used to establish a serious health condition qualifying somebody for FMLA. All right, you're going to get the slides. You're going to read them. They're pretty explanatory. I got a minute left, so I can't read them to you. Okay, but hopefully you'll be able to read these and understand them. COVID changes. Holy mackerel. We're out of time for COVID. It's one o'clock. Fortunately, my fantastic colleague, Christine, who you guys, she's presented, we presented together about a year ago. And then I believe it was last summer sometime, sometime she presented sure on her own. She prepared these slides. They are fantastic. I make no claim to any COVID expertise. Christine is our firm's COVID expert. So these slides are through here. They talk about the vaccination dilemma. They talk about everything you can do, religious accommodations. They're all in here. You're gonna get the slides and you're gonna be able to review those. And if you have any questions, you're gonna be able to call Christine and she'll be able to answer those questions for you. We're out of time, but if you have questions, you know, we'll, we'll do short questions uh, kind of gratis. Um, just to make sure that everybody can get any information they were waiting for on uh, on this presentation. So with that, thank you, and I will surrender my screen. So does everybody feel like their mind has just exploded? <laughs> so thank you, George, for all this information. I would like to go ahead and allow some extra time. I know we are at one o'clock, so if you have to jump off, totally fine. Again, we will make sure that if there is... Um, We'll make sure that the PowerPoint presentation is sent out to everybody after this, as well as the recording. But for anybody that would like to stay on, um, if you have any questions, if George is fine with staying on for a few extra moments, um, we will go ahead and facilitate those. As well as um, George, um, are, would you be fine too if we distributed your contact information, um, if there are any follow-up questions afterwards? Absolutely. And there looks like in the chat, there's a couple of questions. Yes, the slide, you know, I'm gonna give the slides to to, to the SHRM folks and, and there they'll be able to uh, distribute them. So does anybody have any questions? Either you can type it in the message or you can just speak up. Are you all just, just processing all these changes coming down the pipeline? Um, it, it does make um, our professions always busy, always um, valuable, right? There's always a lot going on. Any questions? Well, if we don't have any questions, um, again, George, 
Thank you so much for your time. We will again share out the PowerPoint presentation that George has put together, as well as today's recorded video. I am going to share my screen really quick to just um, show you the SHRM certification information, the credits for CEUs. Um, but again, if we'll leave these up for a few minutes. If you don't uh, gather all this information, we will distribute this out with um, all the other information from today. So I'll keep this up for a little bit here. Erin, I have a quick question. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Okay, I did type it on there, but on the rule, on the new rules under the uh, flexible spending account. Um, and using those funds if they're terminated uh, through the end of the year. Um, is that the entire election or is that just the portion that they funded to the point that they were terminated, George? Give me one second. And let, I, I believe it's the, you know, it, it always has traditionally been, well, before there's been COBRA and they've had to elect COBRA to be able to use the entire election, which any of them would do. Um, give me one second to confirm this, but I believe it's, uh, I believe it's the, hold on, hold on. Um, yeah, it, it looks like it's the full amount. Because these rules, these rules certainly don't change any of the COBRA rules. So anyone could, you know, they, they could elect COBRA for an FSA, which you've got to offer, and they could then spend out in the full amount. Um, so e even if under the under this, uh, it's only their funded portion. Let, I'm giving you a pretty waffly answer, Sherry. Let me let me uh, confirm it. I'm really bad at, I've, I've told people before, I'm really bad at reading guidance on, while I'm on the phone or while I'm on a webinar. So let me look at this and give you a 100% certain answer. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry for overlooking that. My apologies. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, if not, I'm also just going to share, um, quickly wanted to talk just a little bit about um, SHRM Foundation. I don't know if many of you are familiar with SHRM Foundation. Um, sometimes in the past we have done certain of our chapter events and uh, allocated certain funds to go to the Sherm Foundation, as well as when we had our live events, we would do um, uh, raffles or certain sort of um, contests that we could do that we had a prize, but money would be donated to the Sherm Foundation. Um, in essence, the Sherm Foundation is, has a mission to lead positive social, social change impacting all things that work. Um, they are committed to elevating innovative solutions to workplace inclusion challenges, programming designed to inspire and empower the next generation of HR leaders, and awarding scholarships and professional development grants to educate and develop, develop students and HR professionals. Um, so they do provide a lot of resources. So certainly um, I will leave this up, but we will distribute this as well. Um, and it looks like we might have another, hold on. Um, so with that said, sorry, I was trying to read a message at the same time. Clearly, I can't multitask. Um, either mommy brain or blonde. Who knows the, nowadays of late. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for being here. This was such a great turnout. George, again, always a wealth of information. So appreciate everything that you had to share with us today. Thank you all for um, hanging out with us for this past hour and for continuing to be active members with our chapter. Um, Renette has certainly arranged some future events coming up next month. You'll see either in our newsletter or we'll push those out in emails or on social media blasts. But we have some great other topics that are coming down um, for the next month. Um, Amber usually submits out a survey for um, today's meeting. So if you have any feedback, we really appreciate if you guys could um, give us any feedback for things that you'd like to see or things that you would like us to maybe do differently. Um, but again, just thank you for today. And I, I'm typing at the same time because I'm trying to answer a message. But um, I, I just appreciate you all being here today and from the board. Um, I did recognize earlier, but Amber Melling is also on our board. Um, she handles a lot of the communications for us, the newsletter emails that go out. 
as well as Katie Towsley is here and she handles, handles the membership drive. Um, so there was earlier um, last or later last year, we had our membership drive contest that we were doing for, for sure. So Katie oversees that and keeps us all up to date and may reach out to you if you are a past member. So with that said, I don't know if I see anybody else that is on the board that's here today, but if you have any questions, always let us know. Um, and thank you and have a great rest of your week, everyone. Erin, can you share the certification screen again? One more time, I sure can. Yeah, thank you. You all see that? But again, I will make sure that this goes out for everyone that attended today as well. So you have that information. Okay. I think that is, I'm just trying to make sure. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Have a great day.